I want to tell the world community that while we will always put America's interests first, we will deal fairly with everyone, with everyone. All people and all other nations. We will seek common ground, not hostility, partnership, not conflict. And that- the vision and future planning of the United States and the restructuring of the globe into a new world order is not limited to any particular U.S. president, since globalism is a goal that may span 25 years plus. The maximum two-term limit of a U.S. president is about eight years. This is the reason why there are men in the shadows who steer national and foreign policy in a certain direction. The globalists work through groups such as the Bilderberg Group, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Club of Rome, and the Vatican, which has insinuated itself as the New World Order religion, but encompassing all religion through interfaith. These groups and organizations have built a framework that US presidents must work within or risk being assassinated. The chilling infiltration of both American and European institutions is widespread. The Knights of Malta, Opus Dei, Knight Columbus, Freemasonry and Skull and Bones, which are secretly subservient to the Vatican and controlled by the Jesuit order. This is why you see George Bush making the Skull and Bones sign while receiving communion. One can also discern the level of papal involvement by the behaviour of John Kerry. Donald Trump, like his predecessors, must work within the system, including working towards globalist ambitions such as the Club of Rome's plan to divide the world into ten manageable regions, with the Pope as the supreme ruler. We only have to be reminded of what happened to JFK, who rebuffed globalists, intelligence agencies, secret societies and the Roman Catholic Church, even though he was a Catholic. JFK did many things contrary to the objectives of the Deep State and the Vatican. He wanted to de-escalate involvement in Vietnam, dismantle the Federal Reserve, stated he wanted to smash the CIA into a thousand pieces, and to his detriment made a speech that greatly displeased the Vatican about the subject of separation between church and state. JFK was essentially a New World Order nonconformist who had to be eliminated. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, There is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. The event surrounding the assassination of Abraham Lincoln was another event that has been whitewashed by historians and academics. The irrefutable connection to the Jesuit order of the Vatican has been buried under a mountain of frivolous information. Statements from Lincoln himself have been omitted that tell of his anxiety towards an unseen battle with the Pope. Charles Quinoquy, a close friend of President Lincoln, was a disillusioned Catholic priest who had left the Catholic Church and become a Presbyterian minister. He confirmed that the Vatican was behind the Confederate cause, the death of President Lincoln, and that Lincoln's assassins were faithful Roman Catholics ultimately serving Pope Pius IX. The Vatican assassin was John Wilkes Booth, aided and abetted by other staunch Catholics. Mary Surratt, Lewis Powell, George Astoros, David Herald and John Surratt, who were coached by a Jesuit priest. At the time of the trial and hanging, the US government decided to hide the Vatican conspiracy from the public, in case of a public backlash against Catholics from an overwhelming Protestant majority. A psychologist stated in TheAtlantic.com that Donald Trump has personality traits of narcissism, disagreeableness and grandiosity. His personality traits seem undesirable. In many respects, it is a safeguard from the tyranny of the establishment. 
and the men in the shadows. If you look at those removed from power, like Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, as well as leaders whom the US wants to remove, like Assad and Putin, they all have one thing in common. They are independent thinkers, not willing to be a sock puppet for globalists, unlike Hillary Clinton. Donald Trump would be more likely to do things his own way rather than heed the council of advisors of think tank groups and the Jesuit order. Obama was surrounded by Jesuit trained advisors because he, like Bush, Clinton and so many other presidents, are not the real power behind the political throne. However, Trump, like Kennedy, is reliant on the Secret Service to protect him, aircraft mechanics to make sure his plane does not crash, and master chefs to make sure his food is not tainted. Trump will have to make concessions or risk being assassinated. Involved with Putin for I have nothing to do with Putin. I've never spoken to him. I don't know anything about him other than he will respect me. I don't think Putin has any respect whatsoever for Clinton. I think he does respect me. And I hope I get along great with him. It's possible that we won't, Jeremy. I hope that we get along great with Putin because it would be great to have Russia with a good relationship. Right now, we don't have a good relationship. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose, is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and and, and through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy. And the other is the doctrine, the temporal power, and that is dealing with world government. The founders of the CIA, which replaced the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, were Alan Dulles, a Knight of Malta, Harry Truman, a Freemason, and William J. Donovan, who was also a Knight of Malta. Every director of the CIA has had some connection to the Jesuit order, through either a secret society, a Jesuit priest or a Jesuit education. The CIA vet potential US presidents, often grooming candidates or sabotaging them, like the Trump hot mic incident. Here it was apparent that Billy Bush egged Trump on while recording him. Billy Bush is a member of the Bush dynasty. The Bush family are deeply involved with the CIA, the Vatican and Skull and Bones, a secret society that makes their initiates carry out immoral acts or confess sordid details of their lives. These initiates can then be controlled or blackmailed if they start to think independently outside the order. The Parliament of the United Kingdom is controlled in a similar way. Both the House of Lords and the House of Commons are mostly controlled by MI5 or MI6 through blackmailing or destroying individuals with recordings, such as videotapes of politicians engaging in bad behaviour, such as soliciting prostitutes and even pedophilia parties. That is the secret of how politicians are controlled or destroyed by intelligence agencies. Since 9-11, the only director of the CIA who has not been Jesuit trained was Michael Morell, who is a member of Skull and Bones, a society controlled by the Jesuit order. James Clapper, staunch Roman Catholic, is director of national intelligence, a position that makes him an advisor to the president and generally an overseer of all intelligence agencies. The Vatican now controls intelligence agencies, which gives the Jesuits a carte blanche to carry out operations not only in secret, but at the expense of the everyday American tax. An astonishing admission by the Roman Catholic Church. They run the CIA. Did you know the CIA is also dubbed Catholic Intelligence Agency? Catholics in action. Is the CIA truly American? For decades, Jesuit affiliates of the Roman Catholic Church have directed the CIA. Leon Panetta and John Brennan, the current director, are Jesuit trained. Are Jesuits today the same as Jesuits of the past? Are you familiar with the Jesuit oath? 
Its devious plans to control the wealth of the nations, enslave the masses, and depopulate the world. Pope Francis is a Jesuit. Should we be alarmed that the institution the Pope heads also controls the CIA? The CIA's mission is to identify and destroy terrorists and fundamentalists. Pope Francis likewise, and defines them as those who believe in absolute truth, end-time prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation, refuse to yield their liberty of conscience and give up constitutional rights. The insidious agenda of the Jesuits will soon be realized as Pope Francis has been hailed Lord of the World and Savior of the Earth. What does CIA stand for? The Central Intelligence Agency. That is correct. That is what the CIA stands for. Now, do you know what the primary job of the CIA is? Um, I think their primary job would be similar to the police force, but more the central, the head of the law enforcement. Now, Marianne, what is the primary job of the CIA? I believe it has to do with uh, foreign intelligence. The CIA uh, is the foreign spying agency for America. That is also correct. Now, they collect, analyze, evaluate, and disseminate foreign intelligence in order to help make decisions in related, that relate to national security. So you're right. Uh -huh. So Jerome, can you guess what religious group has predominantly run the CIA? I would assume Christians or Catholics. Now, can you guess what religious group has predominantly run the CIA? I'm going to assume or guess uh, the Catholic re re religion. That is correct. Why do you guess that? Uh, because I figured that they might have a, a lot of involvement with the CIA. Now the CIA has been predominantly run by Roman Catholics and a high percentage of them have been members of the Jesuit society. Yeah. So do you know who Jesuits are, Marianne? Um, kind of, yes. I was raised Catholic, so I'm familiar with Jesuits. Okay. And uh, what can you tell me about Jesuits? Well, they seem to be more liberal um, priests, I guess. All right, so uh, they are a male congregation in the Roman Catholic Church, as you know. And so what we're going to do is just read the Jesuit oath, okay? So have you uh, follow along. It says, I furthermore promise and declare that I will, when opportunity present, make and wage relentless war, secretly or openly, against all heretics. I, I will hang, waste, boil, boil flay, strangle, and, and bury alive. alive. Rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women in order to annihilate forever their terrible race. So Lucas, what are your thoughts on the Jesuit oath? Well, based on that oath, I'm not too fond of the group. I haven't really looked into uh, what else they, they claim to stand for, but it's kind of concerning to have a, a group, um, like you said, so um, involved in central intelligence and everything um, and being so uh, motivated by these values. So what are your thoughts on the Jesuit oath? <laughs> the Jesuits are pretty bad people. <laughs> Sounds like. Sounds like they want to kill people. That's not a good thing, is it? Based on the Jesuit oath, the excerpt that we just read, what are your thoughts on Pope Francis being so impactful in social and political issues? I think that we should uh, keep our, uh, you know, separation of state and church. You know, I believe that you know the Pope should stick to his religious issues, and then the government needs to handle the government issues. So now, based on the Jesuit oath, because Pope Francis is a Jesuit, right? How do you feel about Pope Francis being so impactful in political and social issues? I feel that's a sign of prophecy. So I'm not surprised. It's, you know, the Catholic religion is a religion of a universal religion trying to get everyone in the world to follow their same creed. So that doesn't surprise me. Wow, Sean, I was going to ask you now, are you aware that the Bible tells us there is a time coming when our liberty of conscience will be stripped away and that those who stand true to the principles of Protestantism will not be able to buy and sell? Yes, Revelation. The Catholic Herald, which is a news publication for the Roman Catholic Church, gives us a new and interesting way to look at the CIA or the Central Intelligence Agency. By professing right in the very front page of this Catholic Herald news, it states that the Catholic Church thrives in the CIA. 
The headlines read, Why Catholics Thrive in the CIA. The agency has been dubbed, and I quote, Catholics in action, end quote, because the faithful have occupied so many senior positions. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a plain easy giveaway and it should not take a rocket scientist or anyone with great qualifications to understand that the Roman Jesuits, or should I say, the Vatican, is the one that runs the Central Intelligence Agency. Make some very interesting notes here. Make note that the CIA thrives in the United States of America. It has the seal of the United States and the symbol of the United States right on it. The eagle is right there. Secondly, make note, the Jesuit order thrives primarily at the Vatican. However, what you need to understand is that the Jesuit order is a secret police for the Vatican and what they have done is they have successfully infiltrated every other governmental structure in the world today. But they will disguise themselves as Roman Catholics and that is because they are Roman Catholics. Just as you have Joe Biden, he is the first Roman Catholic Vice President of the United States of America. While he is the very first Vice President who is a Roman Catholic, we also have the very first Jesuit Roman Catholic leader, the Pope, Pope Francis. In case you missed it, let me go back and repeat myself again so you will understand exactly what I'm telling you. These Jesuits, though they infiltrate other governmental structures, they simply will never tell you that they are Jesuits, but they will tell you that they are simply Roman Catholics. Their allegiance belongs to the Pope. These so-called Roman Catholics, they are Jesuits, especially the ones who are in political structures or in judicial positions of power. The United States of America is run by Jesuits. They used the order of the Masons as scapegoats. The majority of people, the minute they hear the words Freemason, they automatically think the most evil secret society. But when they hear Jesuits, they think, oh, Pope Francis is a Jesuit. He's a good person. He's a Roman Catholic. I think the Jesuits are connected to the Roman Catholics. They have hospitals and schools and many other good institutions, so they're not that bad. But that's how they operate. They operate in a very subtle way. The evidence for this is that we see a reflection between America and the Vatican. The United States Capitol is designed to resemble the Vatican. The obelisk in the United States of America also is a direct reflection of the obelisk of Rome and the Vatican. The symbols of sun worship within the Freemasons and within the Jesuit order, it's all the exact same. Going back to the CIA, when we look at the symbol of the CIA, the United States seal, what we also...
great attention placed on the NSA's mass surveillance of American citizens, it's easy to forget the other countries that are taking a page out of the agency's spy book. Just this past weekend, it was revealed that in 2008, Australia's surveillance agency shared information about the country's citizens with its most trusted intelligence partners. Perhaps the most concerning part of this recently leaked Snowden document was the discussion between these allies over whether or not to share the medical, legal, and religious information of Australian citizens. But this story is just a microcosm of the larger international spying cabal working together to peer into every nook and cranny of the world. So who exactly are these peeping partners? Well, they call themselves the Five Eyes, a partnership made up of intelligence agencies in five English-speaking countries, the US, the UK, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. And just like the Eye of Sauron, I see all, which is an especially appropriate analogy since the Lord of the Rings was filmed in New Zealand. But I digress. You see, the Five Eyes Agreement has been around since the end of World War II, but it was so secret that the program wasn't even disclosed to the public until 2005. On the surface, this treaty is just a friendly agreement between allied nations that it's essential to stopping global terrorism. But thanks to the Snowden leaks, we now know just what an asinine agreement it's actually being used for. Industrial espionage and circumventing those pesky laws that prohibit warrantless surveillance of a country's own citizens. In theory, these nations are not allowed to spy on each other's people. But we all know rules are meant to be broken. In 2007, the NSA analyzed and retained any British citizen's mobile phone number, email, and IP address swept up in its enormous dragnet. Another memo dated from 2005 shows that the NSA was working on a procedure to spy on the other four countries. And while one sentence in the memo states that the U.S. and U.K. will not explicitly target each other, the very next sentence says governments reserve the right to spy on each other's citizens when it's in the best interest of each nation. Well, that's not open to interpretation at all. Look, I think it's clear at this point that the myth of the American empire exporting freedom and democracy really means exporting surveillance and subjugation. Guys, there's a lot going on in the world, a lot that you might disagree with. But as much as we protest and complain to our elected representatives, it doesn't seem to shape the actual legislation put into action. Foreign policy is supposed to be drafted between the president and Congress, but that would be too easy, It'd be too democratic. So instead, legislation is now outsourced. Policy prescriptions are made by think tanks and NGOs like the Council on Foreign Relations, the Atlantic Council, and the Trilateral Commission. The idea of having academics researching world issues, pairing with world journalists, to help keep our elected officials informed sounds like a good idea, right? Sure. But what happens when the policy recommendations are being made by the councils and think tanks whose board members are the CEOs of some of the biggest corporations in the world? Is it a conflict of interest that many of these councils are run by executives from almost every major industry, from food to media, and most shockingly, national defense? Let's take a look at just some of the few. The Council on Foreign Relations. Their mission statement is in part sponsoring independent task forces that produce reports with both findings and policy prescriptions on the most important foreign policy topics. The question I ask is, what sort of policy prescriptions can we expect from a board of directors that includes Madeleine Albright and Colin Powell, both of whom served as U.S. Secretary of State, and Tom Brokaw and Fareed Zakaria, both too well known establishment journalists. So, these folks aren't even in government anymore, yet they sit on the board of one of the most influential think tanks in the world. Now, if you doubt the CFR's influence, just take a listen of a clip of Hillary Clinton's first visit as Secretary of State to the CFR headquarters right here in Washington, D.C. We get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have this far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. What we should be doing and how we should think about the future? Gee, Hillary, you're really letting the cat out of the bag there. Now, you may be wondering why you don't hear about these groups' influence from the corporate media. As I mentioned before, extremely powerful and influential media moguls sit on these boards. They are part of the establishment. And the CFR is only one of these groups. What about the Atlantic Council? 
According to the Atlantic Council's website, part of their focus is on drafting roadmaps for U.S. policy toward the Balkans, Cuba, Iraq, Iran, and Libya. Now, this is especially interesting because membership of the Atlantic Council includes some of the top defense corporations in the country. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon. So why are the top defense corporations in the world advising our lawmakers on foreign policy? As we know, the revolving door between government and corporations never stops spinning. The Bilderberg Group can be summed up in their goals and aspirations by looking at the founders. Joseph Rettinger, who once studied to be a Catholic priest in a Jesuit seminary, was concerned about the anti-Americanism in Western Europe. He approached Prince Berhard of the Netherlands, who then in turn contacted Paul van Zeeland of the Catholic Party of Belgium. Prince Berhard contacted Walter Bedel Smith, director of the CIA, and facilitated guest lists through Eisenhower's advisor Charles Douglas Jackson, who was an expert in psychological warfare and director of the defunct OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the forerunner of the CIA. So the Bilderberg Group founders consisted of royalty, intelligence service directors, a member of the Roman Catholic political party, and the influences of the Jesuit order Noviate, Joseph Frittinger. Enough said. Well, secretive and elite, the Bilderberg, Bilderberg Group unites the world's most powerful people behind closed doors. It's been happening for decades. Some even believe it's a venue where the world's most rich and powerful conspire to carve out a new world order. RT correspondent Abby Martin was in Chantilly, Virginia today to let us know what's happening outside of the Bilderberg Conference and joins us now to tell us all about it. Abby, nice to see you. you. Um, so we have a lot of powerful people all in one room. Happens all the time. So what's all the fuss about? The egregious violation of federal law. There's, a, there's an act called the Logan Act, which says that you cannot meet with foreign diplomats without congressional oversight. And I think that that's really the main key here is people are like, hold on, why are there 130 of the most powerful world players in banking, mining, oil, food, media, defense, and politics? Why are they all getting together and meeting in secrecy behind closed doors without any congressional oversight or really any awareness of what it is they're talking about? Breaking news tonight, the Pope in America, a rousing welcome for the man who's been called the rock star Pope, rock star Pope, Francis begins a historic visit. the two leaders will speak to the world, then hold a one-on-one -on -one meeting with only translators in the room, all before Pope Francis addresses Congress Thursday with Biden in attendance. Even though the president and the pope are allies on issues ranging from climate change to income inequality to Cuba, even the Iran nuclear deal, the White House refuses to reveal what the two men will discuss. The White House refuses to reveal what the two men will discuss. For the faithful who'd been waiting for hours, the emergence of Pope Francis shortly before 9 a.m. was the thrill of a lifetime. With thousands, led by the President and Mrs. Obama, waited to greet him. And after the official welcoming ceremony, both leaders addressed the significance of the visit. And I believe the excitement around your visit, Holy Father, must be attributed not only to your role as Pope, Uh, 30 seconds left. Anything else? Yes, I would like to just end with this note. As far as all the things that have happened while the Pope has been visiting here, the thing that bothered me the most is when he said Christ failed on the cross. And I did a report earlier in the day. People can go and look at why I reference certain scriptures. But Christ didn't fail on the cross. He knew he was going to die on the cross. And he said, I'm giving myself willingly. So I was very disturbed to hear something like that. He come said out that? I didn't know that. That was Christ's oh, yeah. ultimate triumph. Yeah. And he said he failed on the cross. As an ABC News, I'm sure it's a multiple Sounds other Sounds like something the devil well. would say, Jakari, I think. And if at times our efforts and works seem to fail and not produce fruit, we need to remember 
that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And his life, humanly speaking, ended in failure, the failure of the cross. Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis erenus iluxit, et tecum vivit et regnat in secula seculorum. words from Cardinal Timothy Dolan, but before that, you can see the Pope greeting members of the religious faiths one by one. And as he entered the hall as well, greeting many who were there to see him, this is an important Papa Francesco, on behalf of this very distinguished group, representatives of the Hindu, Buddhist, Jain, Sikh, Native American, Jewish, Islamic, and Christian communities of New York City. Yes. You say to them, yeah. look, I have to have the Sabbath yes. off. Yes. Which, may I just confess that I learned in my first meeting with Devon, all these years I thought the Sabbath was Sunday. Yeah. I've been going to church. We say worship on the Sabbath, worship on the Sabbath in the Baptist church. And you corrected me. You said, no, Sunday is the first day of the week. Sabbath is Friday sundown to Saturday Sunday. That's right. That's I right. stand corrected. That's because Sunday is a day of worship. You're supposed to be in a Christian church. But wait a second, aren't we supposed to have religion, religious freedom in America? Some religions worship on different days. Because blue laws, which date back to colonial times, still ban that in a dozen states. Originally, they outlawed regular Sunday work. No buying, no selling, traveling, public entertainment, or sports even. It's baked in, have always had this temptation to let work crowd out all the other things that matter. Family, faith, and they have to be told again and again, knock it off, don't work. It's interesting. You think people yeah. are lazy, but they work too much. Americans work too much. Maybe, but they should certainly be able to choose their own days off. The idea that somehow a bunch of guys in a state capital somewhere know what's best for us in terms of, you know, how many days off we take and when we take them. Isn't it Everyone listen to the Pope speak on the importance of keeping Sunday as the Sabbath. We are called to reflect more deeply on the mystery of creation and therefore of our own life. We are called to rest. Especially those in situations of greater vulnerability or risk. Legislative activity is always based to take care of the body people. To this, you have been invited, called, and convinced by those who elect you. Yours is a walk which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. On the one hand, the patriarch and lawgiver of the people of Israel symbolizes the need of people 
to keep alive the essence of unity by means of just legislation. Our particular campaign in the European Agency for Safety and Health at Work is about psychosocial risks and stress in the workplace. And the reason we decided on that topic is because our board is tripartite, governments, unions and employers. I think the evidence we have um, in terms of um, in terms of looking at long hours is that it's not so much which day of the week you are working for us it's a question that every worker has to get adequate rest now there are other cultural issues around the Saturday and Sunday working and in particular for the Sunday working I think it's interesting what the recent Eurofound uh, survey has to say about this there's an increasing number of people having to work on Sundays an increasing number of people uh, having uh, are saying that it is impacting on their on their family lives from the occupational safety and health point of view we're very keen that workers get adequate rest but I think if you look at that European working conditions survey from Eurofound you will see that that Sunday working is definitely impacting as well on family life and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Uh, stocks up on supplies at the supermarket. But Karin, like most people here in Sweden, won't be paying with cash when she gets to the checkout. I personally never use cash. Uh, as you see here, I'm shopping. I use my scanner. Uh, when I check out, I'll use my credit card. And my banking, I do on my iPhone. So that's it. I don't need any cash. Um, he is now joining the war on cash. We've seen that from the ECB, and uh, they're saying, oh, we should get rid of the 500 euro note. In the UK, we're seeing the former chief executive of Standard Chartered. He's saying that we should uh, get rid of the 50 pound note. So there's a war on cash going on. They're saying it's because they want to stop terrorism. They're saying because they want to stop money laundering. Um, but as we've seen over and over, the banks are the ones that are involved in that anyway, so... Popular culture proclaims the RFID chip is the mark of the beast. However, let us first ponder the scripture. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Before we investigate what the mark of the beast is, we must first discover how the no buy and sell will be administered, and only a cashless society can achieve that. The greatest misconceptions are spread by repeating the opinions of others. Let us go straight to the source, the Bible, and learn the clear and distinct definition of what exactly is the mark of the beast. A beast in Bible prophecy is a kingdom as explained in the following verse. Daniel 7.23 Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Now the mark which belongs to the papacy is the professed holy day of mainstream Christianity. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September 1st, 1923. Protestants accept Sunday rather than Saturday as the day for public worship after the Catholic Church made the change. But the Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in observing Sunday, they are accepting the authority of the spokesman for the church, the Pope. Our Sunday Visitor, February the 5th, 1950. Sunday keeping went mainstream as a day of worship and rest in 321 AD, when Emperor Constantine decreed it under the influence of his flatterer, Bishop Eusebius. The divinely appointed Sabbath, Saturday, was moved to Sunday, Dia Solus, and those true Christians who disobeyed the Sunday apostasy were penalized and persecuted. 
Bishop Eusebius was the hidden hand in this religio-political decree as Emperor Constantine realised the religio-political benefits uniting pagans and Christians within the Roman Empire. Bishop Eusebius was part of an apostate Christian movement that evolved into the Roman Catholic Church. His Sunday keeping had been preeminent among apostate Christians around 70 years before Emperor Constantine's decree. The fourth commandment, Exodus 28, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, has never been changed under any biblical or apostolic instruction. Jesus, the disciples and all the early churches mentioned in the Bible, for example Corinthia, Thessalonica, Galatia and churches in Rome, kept the Sabbath Saturday. The Pope's title, Vicarious Filii Dei, Vicar or Representative of the Son of God, adds up to 666 in Latin, Greek and Hebrew. Vicarious or Vicar is derived from the word substitute as the Pope assumes the title Substitute of Christ on Earth. Therefore, Mark of the Beast 666 is a prophecy that every nation will enforce a Sunday law by fine, economic sanctions and finally the death penalty. The United States or Vatican Alliance can achieve this goal through controlling the global financial systems of the world, implementing sanctions or withholding global currency or access to the swift international payment system. The mark of the beast is an invisible mark, and like the seal of God, which is also invisible, is an individual choice of whom to obey, symbolizing either God's commands or Satan's counterfeit. The mark in the forehead pertaining to both the mark of the beast and the seal of God signifies the moral choice of how they will obey, as the frontal lobe at the front of the forehead is where moral decisions are made, therefore the mark is symbolic of that choice. However, the mark of the beast can also be found in the hand, signifying actions. For example, an atheist or Muslim can keep the global Sunday law by actions, and by those actions they will receive the mark in their right hand different to those who receive the mark of the beast in their foreheads by believing and choosing Sunday as their religion. And those who refuse the Sunday law will be penalised and persecuted in stages of fines, imprisonment and the death penalty. You may say that the Sabbath day, Saturday, belongs to the Jews. However, the book of Genesis negates this idea, Genesis 2-3, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So Genesis chapter 2 verse 3 silences the argument that only the Jews were commanded to keep the Sabbath. James chapter 2 10 For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. In the issue of the contest, all Christendom will be divided into two great classes those who keep the commandment of God and have the faith in Jesus and those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark. Although church and state will unite in their power to compel small and great, rich and poor, free and in bond. Revelation chapter 13 verse 16 Yet the people of God will not receive it. But Christians of past generations observed Sunday, supposing that in so doing they were keeping the Bible Sabbath. And now there are true Christians in every church not accepting the Roman Catholic Communion, who honestly believe that Sunday is the Sabbath of divine appointment. God accepts their sincerity of purpose and their integrity before him. But when the Sunday observance shall be enforced by law, and the world shall be enlightened concerning the obligation of the true Sabbath, then whosoever shall transgress the law of God to obey a precept that has no higher authority than that of Rome, will then honour popery above God. He is paying homage to Rome and to the power that enforces the institution ordained by Rome and is worshipping the beast in his image. Men will then reject the institution that God has declared to be the sign of his authority and honour in its stead that which Rome has chosen in token of her supremacy. They will have then set their sign as their allegiance to Rome. The Mark of the Beast and it is not until the issue is plainly set before the people and they are brought to choose between the commandments of God and the commandments of men. Those who continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast. Many think the RFID chip will be the mark of the beast. However, this theory does not pass the biblical test. But nevertheless, the RFID chip, facial recognition machines, smart card with SIM, Apple Pay, and many other identification cards 
a validation that a world government can implement a no-buy-sell ultimatum if the Pope's mark, Sunday Law, is not observed. 